just ask um, Mrs. Philbin to confirm that that's the case. OK, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone to today's meeting of the Children and Learning Committee of the 12th of August 2021. And uh, we shall push on now with the agenda. Um, agenda item number one, apologies and substitutes. Yes, Vice Convener, we have an apology from Councillor Wan with Councillor Fotheringham substituting, Bellahan and Mrs Cheen. OK, thank you. Uh, Agenda item two, declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations to declare? But silence on that point. I think we now move on to agenda item three, minutes of the previous meeting. Does anybody have any comments or questions or comments upon the, the minutes of the previous meeting? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take that as read and approved. We now come on to agenda item number four. Okay, it helps if I can jump to it. That's it. Get my bootmarks working. Right, agenda item number four in regards to report 2721, and it concerns the education recovery, return to school arrangements for August 2021. And I believe that uh, Beth Reader will uh, introduce the report. Beth, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. I'm very pleased to be presenting the latest in um, our series of education recovery reports, uh, focuses on the arrangements that are in place to support the return to schools. Um, our staff yes. return. Um, to our school meetings on Tuesday this week, and we welcome children and young people back on Wednesday. Uh, the guidance was issued to us last week, and we've, we've been working behind the scenes to put everything in place. I'd like to make members aware of a very minor amendment to the information that's in paragraph 4.3 in the report. The guidance relating to face coverings has been amended very slightly uh, to refer to learners in secondary schools um, instead of uh, young people over the age of 12. So there's a slight amendment there, and that will be in reference to the fact that we do have some 11 year olds um, who will be in S1 at the moment. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that members may have on the content of the report. Anybody, any questions for Beth? Councillor Devine, followed by Councillor Whiteside. Councillor Devine, on you go, please. Thank you, Councillor Sturck. Um, I, it's a, a bit of a comment, but I do have a question at the end, if that's OK. Um, okay. I'm referring to um, 4.11, because I, I can't actually express how happy I am to see that the Scottish Government's recognising the value of music tuition to children. We've seen the huge impact on children, parents and communities, in fact, in the Raploch in Stirling and more recently in Dundee and Glasgow, where the big noise gives children the ability to learn an instrument and the positive knock-on effects that has on their general learning. So that's all to be incredibly welcomed. We have such fine music teachers and tutors here in Angus, whom I can't praise highly enough, having attended many a fantastic concert. I'm delighted that more children will be able to take advantage of their expertise and enthusiasm. Albeit, I'm sure there will be challenges in terms of capacity, and that's the issue I just want to address. Can you give us some idea of how you see this being dealt with? I'm happy to answer your question. So the funding that we've been allocated um, so far covers the costs um, based on existing provision for music. Um, so it's not about we're not kind of um, able to kind of expand beyond what we have. It's within our current um, budgetary arrangements. So the costs would cover the costs that families currently accessing music tuition would pay. So that's their fees, the music higher access to music lessons is is also through a competency assessment, um, which you know, we, we do particularly whether it's oversubscribed um, you know, uh, musical instruments, which there will be in some places, depends on the availability of instructors. As well. so, what we have in place at the moment from the government covers our existing provision, just to be clear. Right. <clears throat> OK, does that answer your question and comment, uh, Councillor um, Devine? Well, it, 
it uh, doesn't. It doesn't. I, I'm hoping that we will be able to find some way in which we can extend this to other children, um, because I'm sure there are a lot of uh, of them out there who would like to take this up. So it might be that we just have to look at future budgets in this respect. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's fine. Thank you, uh, Councillor Devine. As regards music tuition, uh, as one who um, had it myself from many, many years ago, I fully support the music tuition um, avenue on this one. I thank you. Now, Councillor Whiteside. Thank you. Um, I just want to commend um, Beth and Kelly and all the education team for the resilience and um, getting through this difficult period. And thanks for the report. There's a lot of good information in there. Um, I wanted to comment on the this week's announcement by the Scottish Government that they'll be funding um, extra extra funds for permanent staff, and I, I really welcome this. And that announcement probably came after the paper was written, so I just wondered if you have any more information about how uh, how that will impact us in Angus. Um, I'll outline a little bit and then I'll pass over to Kelly. Um, so the the funding um, it, it did come slightly too late to be included in this paper, um, and the allocation for Angus, well, I can't remember the exact value of it, covers roughly 22 teachers and 11 support staff. Um, in terms of how we're planning to take forward that spend, I'm going to hand over to Kelly, who can outline a bit more about how we'll be um, addressing that. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Do I see a question, Councillor Whiteside? You happy that? Um, yeah, but I think Kelly's going to um, tell us a little bit more. Yeah, thanks okay. very much. Thank you, Beth. Um, as elected members will be aware, throughout the, the last year, the government have given us additional one-year funding so that we can employ staff and support staff for a year to help our schools to recover and respond. The funding that we were notified of just last week, um, the letter that's come with it speaks about offering permanent contracts. And Beth is correct, it's for 22 teachers and 11 support staff. So this is money that would come into our base budget. So it's very different from what we had been offered previously. And if elected members remember from one of our last recovery reports, for this session, we were looking to take on 20 temporary staff for a year and the equivalent of 10.5 school support staff. Although many of those were just having their hours increased, it was people who we already employed and we were increasing their hours. So with regards to what we're going to do with this permanent money, to be quite honest, if we simply, you might think you might simply give the temporary staff permanent contracts, but we also have the COVID money that was given us to us for those temporary staff. So to be very honest, Beth and I have got a meeting with our colleagues in finance last week because the letters that come from the government are very definite about what you can and can't do with money and we just want to make sure that we're doing it in the right way. We will also obviously um, consult with our head teachers about their needs So what's going on at the moment to find out if we have any vacancies in secondary, any particular areas of need and we will of course be looking to bring teaching staff in that will help us and facilitate us to take forward um, our priorities in the new annual education plan. <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. Thank you. OK, thanks for that uh, clarification, Kelly. Uh, next, we have Councillor Brays to be followed by Councillor Proctor. Councillor Brays. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, yes, uh, I'm sure everyone in this committee will uh, uh, welcome this extra money from the Scottish Government. Um, my question goes back to 4.11 which uh, Councillor Devine uh, brought up. Um, I believe we have an in inventory of musical instruments um, available to, to pupils. And I just wondered if that inventory is much the same as it has been for the last three or four years, or if there have been disposals over that period. Thanks. Um, I'm afraid I don't actually have that information to hand. Um, uh, excellent, thank you. Uh, hi, thanks, Councillor Blaise, for your question. Uh, two, three years ago, there was a number of very old instruments that were disposed of, but there is budget within the uh, instrumental music instruction uh, budget that allows us to, to repair and replace 
there's quite a significant programme of that, probably about three years ago, to make sure that this, the uh, instruments that the young people and children are able to access are of a good standard uh, and can be loaned out year on year. Uh, and I suppose one of the benefits of the new monies is that we'll no longer be charging for instrument hire. So it makes that wee bit more uh, attractive again. I hope that answers your question. Well, it, it certainly does. Thank you very much. And, and it's really, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that uh, income isn't going to be a barrier to any longer to, uh, to the ability for children to get tuition in musical instruments. Thanks. OK, thank you for that, Jim. Uh, next, we go to Councillor Proctor, please. Thank you very much, convener. I'd like to thank um, um, Kelly McIntosh uh, and Beth for, for highlighting these various points and also congratulate everybody who has worked to put this report together. I think it's, I, I, I go back to the music uh, part again, which is mentioned by Councillor Devine and Councillor Braze. Um, it's really great to see that we've actually got funding for this, because I remember, as I'm sure will Councillor Devine, that in the last administration, um, we had to fight uh, to continue to keep uh, music tuition and what to get young children came from Forfar Academy uh, sort of pleading um, their case. And thank goodness uh, now that with this extra funding, um, that will not be required anymore. So I would just like to welcome uh, the report and and um, thank uh, those who have compiled it. Very positive and thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Proctor. Councillor Braze, is that a legacy hand from you? OK, thank you. Uh, now that uh, seems to be all the questions. Does anybody have any comment? Uh, no comment? OK, uh, colleagues, um, if we can now just um, agree the recommendations as, as per 1112 and 13 of report 23721. Is the report agreed? Agreed. OK, thank you, colleagues. We now move to agenda item number five, it's flashed up here, is the report 23821, the evaluation of the remote learning offer. And I believe that Jim Hammond, the service leader, is going to uh, introduce this report. Thank you, Councillor Sturrock. Um, as we're aware, we've had two periods of lockdown, and after the first period of lockdown, there was a remote learning offer, and our schools evaluated that um, indep independently at that point, with a real view to improving that offer uh, and making it part of the mainstream offer of, it, of what schools offer, and also if there was another uh, lockdown that they were fit for it again. Lo and behold, in January 2021, we entered that in, into that second lockdown period. And at that point, the Scottish Government, through Education Scotland, issued uh, new guidance with increased expectations and clarity around what was expected around remote learning. And as a result of that, uh, our central team working with school leaders and school staff produced our own Angus Council guidance. Um, that guidance was agreed at Children and Learning Committee in February 2021. And as part of that report, it was agreed to the, the Director of Education and Lifelong Learning to undertake an individual evaluation of the remote learning and present a copy of its findings. So that's where we are today. So today's report uh, provides committee with this evaluation of remote learning across all Angus schools. It details feedback on the learning offer, engagement with children, uh, young people and families, and stakeholders' views. <coughs> the feedback and related data inform the next steps contained within the report, and Appendix B gives you more detail on, on the actual outcomes of the evaluation. This report really represents the high level tab collaboration between school staff, central staff, and the wider um, uh, education lifelong team, including our DLOs, who were an integral part of that. Happy to take any questions or any comments related to the report. Thank you. Well, thank you that for Mr. Hammond. First, I have on the list here is Councillor Miles, followed by Councillor Devine, followed by Councillor Whiteside. So, Councillor Miles, on you go, please. Yes, uh, Councillor Sturrock. Uh, very much uh, appreciate the, the offer of the remote learning. 
but uh, recognising the fact that uh, access to internet is still not uh, overly great in some rural areas. Has there been any problems getting to some of these the children in the rural areas? Or have, have there been other uh, 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 things done to, to, to allow them to access the remote learning? Thanks uh, very much, Councillor Miles, for your question. I mean, um, connectivity is, a, is is always an issue, with, particularly in rural areas, and schools have worked with individual families to overcome these. Sometimes that's been an invitation to work in the school. Sometimes that's been providing the resources physically, so in hard copy. Uh, and we've also, as part of government funding, we received 400 uh, MiFi internet connections. So where there was difficulties with uh, families get connected, there was that um, connectivity uh, facilitated through these MiFi devices, but schools were really sensitive to that and really worked with families to make sure that the right resources were the right children at the right time. Thank you for that. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Councillor Miles. Councillor Devine, please. Thanks, Vice Convener. Um, I just I want to thank everybody involved with this. Um, the first lockdown, I think, was a huge challenge to everybody uh, to change their ways of teaching and, and learning. And clearly there was uh, tremendous learning done in that time because everything, it, it, it improved dramatically, quite clearly. Um, I, I just want to ask a question. It's really just right at the end of the uh, of page 30 of the appendix about next steps and Wondering if you were thinking of using uh, remote learning for perhaps less popular subjects. My 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 thought always goes to Russian for some reason, <laughs> but I mean I'm sure there's only a few people want to learn Russian. But it would be great if they could uh, all learn from the one teacher uh, without having to leave their school. So uh, I'm just wondering if that is being thought about or indeed is it already being done <laughs> and another one for me would be modern studies because we don't have modern studies in all our schools as i thanks, quite often say <laughs> thanks councillor divine with, uh, for your question i was hoping to come back with a witty bit of russian in, from the repertoire but I, that simply doesn't exist um <laughs> so yeah it, it has been looked at to to some point uh, um subjects which have been difficult to deliver in schools i suppose in the past what has happened is that young people where subjects have not been on offer have actually had to physically travel to other locations which has its limitations uh, in terms of uh, the pressure that it's on young people and, and getting to the right place at the right time we're actually working at uh trick levels so tayside regional level um to actually deliver that type of remote learning and, and it is actually in particularly with in relation to um languages funnily enough and they were offering uh, advanced hires in spanish uh, and computing and also in french and that will be a virtual offer and also, of course this complements the the access that young people have had through east school uh, throughout the, the the pandemic to su support their ongoing studies uh, and i'd say uh, just as an aside uh, we've got a young person who's transitioning up to Forfar Academy who will be accessing Gaelic through East Goyle as part of their broad general education as well. So it, it really shows you the breadth and the opportunities that the remote learning has thrown up for a universal officer offer to all children and young people. Yeah. I think there's great opportunities here. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. I can only um, uh, say what, uh, about Russian because I worked in Russia for many years and I couldn't get my tongue around the language. I could read it a fair bit, but getting my tongue around Russian though, was not easy, I'll tell you. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Whiteside. Thank you, um, Councillor Sturrock. Um, my question probably overlaps a little bit with Councillor Devine's, um, but I was just going to um, ask you in what other ways the learning that's that's come out of this will benefit mm -hmm the schools in the future going to, going forward and extra subjects that's that's one thing there's probably environmental benefits as well with um, avoiding people having to do unnecessary travel but maybe you can expand on that yeah happy to do that i mean obviously the environmental bit and, and reducing our carbon footprint is, is an important part and also keeping children within their own school community and uh, and working alongside peers and, and not being separated from that at all is an important part of it 
I suppose what, what schools are doing is they're really looking at the learning offer, how that supports learning at home, that family engagement in learning as well, um, around the resources being readily available. Uh, I also think around when children have had periods of absence from school, it was difficult to support that in, in, in the past, and that's facilitated um, much more easily now with what being posted on Teams. So that getting right down that individual support around the core curriculum has been, has been a really important part, as well as involving uh, families and, uh, and parents in, in that learning too. Schools are always looking for opportunities, and I suppose what we're doing at the moment is really trying to capture that these opportunities, and I, I suppose that's something we're happy to return to as a, as a future uh, as part of these discussions at Children and Learning Committee, where we have significant moves forward to, to report on that. OK, thank you. Now we come to Councillor Bell to be followed by Councillor McMillan Douglas. I am aware that there are other hands up. I'll just name two at a time, please. So Councillor Bell. Thank you very much, convener, and thanks, Jim, for that report. Um, it's very encouraging. I was very pleased to see those metrics in the the graphics on page 26. You know, there's uh, there's literally no room for improvement in in some of those columns, but that immediately drew my attention to the the two percent gap on the on the last one around what primary schools. Uh, felt uh, they were they were lacking in resources. I wondered if you had anything specific on that. Um, I appreciate it's a tiny percentage, and they are really positive um, percentages all round. Um, but it was the the gap, as I say, that that drew my eye. Thanks, Councillor Bell. I don't actually have any specific data on that at this particular point. It, it wasn't captured within the the general feedback. I think just as a level of assurance, though, around where families did identify uh, there was difficulties, there was challenges, the resources weren't quite meeting their needs. Schools were really, really responsive, uh, both at class teacher level, who were maintaining that day-to-day -day engagement with children uh, and young people through Teams calls, through phone calls when the engagement had dropped, um, through often the chap in the door um, to, uh, from senior management teams to say, how are things going? So, yeah, I mean, I was surprised when the, the, the figures came back that we were uh, hitting up at 100%. Um, but within that lays a, a lot of detail around where the challenges were overcome, because things weren't perfect. Uh, and we didn't get it right first time, but we got it right eventually. And I think that was around the hard work around school leaders, the class teachers, just as I was saying, around working with families, keeping them engaged, keeping going back, asking the right questions, offering the learning supports, but also the other supports around um, where they knew there were challenges financially with, with families and, and, and getting um, vouchers and uh, grants and, and, and the right monies to help that ongoing support. Because we realised the learning was a very small part of, uh, of lockdown. It was a really, really important part that the children's welfare was, um, was equally as high on the agenda and, and we never wanted to lose sight of that. OK, thank you, Jim. Now we go to Councillor McMillan Douglas, followed by Councillor Speed. Chair, uh, Chair, I wanted to mention, do you want me to go now or do you no, want me I'll to just, uh, No, I've got a few other uh, people with hands up for questioning. So I'll, I'll call for comment uh, in a little while. OK. So we can go to Councillor Speed, please. Question? Yep. Thanks, convener. Um, I'm just looking for assurances then that now we are uh, sure that, I guess, every parent, carer and family with a child in education in Angus is now digitally connected and has the relevant uh, devices um, to be able to uh, access learning. Councillor Speed, thanks for your question. Uh, in short answer, we're not there yet. However, through the first and second lockdown, the families who were in greatest need and identified that need and the schools work with them, have the devices. Um, over the course of this, we issued 2,500 Chromebooks and iPads to children and young people. They are now their devices. That was supported by 400 uh, MiFi internet connections. Um, so the families that really targeted uh, or, or were needing that support and needing that access have these devices. We're still awaiting Scottish government money as part of the 100 day promise. 
um, ar around what the universal officer offer for um, a device for all families, and, and we'll weigh that with uh, great pleasure mm -hmm. in, in getting these devices out to family when they come. OK, thanks, Mr Hammond. OK, thank you. Uh, now, the next question is from Councillor Proctor to be followed by Eric Summers. Councillor Proctor. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions followed by comments. If I'm not going to give the comments as to thereafter. Um, the first question is really much the same as what Councillor Speed has said, um, and uh, that is regarding, and, and Councillor Miles, is regarding the connectivity and the ability to actually get uh, to pupils in, in the remote areas. And the second question is, um, I hear what you're saying about these, um, you, you know, IT equipment being made available to school children, which is great. Um, what happens when the child uh, leaves school? Does the instrument get handed back into a sort of pool um, that redistributed, or are they just sort of written off and uh, and the, and the kids, uh, um, you know, use them for something else later on? The, the connectivity bit is it, it's always going to present challenges and it's never going to be perfect. That's that's the honest answer to it. We, we mean, we have parts of Angus, even within small urban areas such as Edsel, um, where, where connectivity uh, has been challenging. And I'm sure Councillor Miles uh, it will be well versed in that and, and, and his other briefing councillor colleagues. Um, so it is really trying to work with people and it, it's when, when it can get established it's about finding other ways of, of maintaining that contact and um, whether that's through phone calls to, to do uh, tutoring and whether that's a provision of hard copy resources so it's it's really trying to get bespoke fits for for individual circumstances around that and using the the monies that we have uh, available to us through the covid monies to try and target that need indeed in terms of the, the myfi dongles and the, the extra devices I'm going to bring uh, my colleague Beth Reader in just around the, the recycling of machines because my memory fails me on that one and I know Beth heavily been involved in that. Um, yep, happy to pick up on that. So um, when, a, a, when a device is issued, it stays with the, the child throughout their, their time in Angus education and it would be handed back um, when they leave. However, most of these devices do have a shelf life. So if um, if somebody was issued with a device in, say, primary three, um, it may be that you know, they would take it with them for as long as the device lasts for. But where devices are in a usable state, we will take them back and then kind of reissue them um, later. And again, it'll be interesting to see what the kind of terms of the the one to one device package looks like, um, because there will obviously be some considerations for us around that and how we manage um, but but for the time being, the, the devices that young people have now that we've issued, they will be staying with them. And indeed, our, our P7s who have just moved into S1 uh, will have taken their devices with them to secondary school. So so they will have the benefit um, in their new schools as well. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I understand fully what you're saying about the, the life of the device, because <clears throat> I just had to buy a new desktop computer because... My old one, I'm told, is very old. It was only 11 years old, but there, there we go. Um, uh, convener, can I, can I just make two comments now, if that's possible? Uh, no, I'd rather move on, in case Mr Eric okay. Summers uh, has a question. You can you can Probably. stay on and uh, keep your hand up for the comment section to come shortly. So, Eric Summers, please. <coughs> Thank you, convener. My apologies, it doesn't support uh, uh, video at the moment, uh, but I hope you can hear me OK. Yeah, we can uh, hear you. Uh, uh, Jim, I want to I want to add my uh, um, <clears throat> congratulations and commendations to the staff and pupils of Angus for the way they've they've worked so hard through this very very difficult period. Um, I've seen it close up, and I know how very demanding it is managing pupils who still are in the school and also trying to look after pupils uh, remotely. But I have two questions um, emerging from your experience. One, we're always on the lookout for improved pedagogy that will um, make for better learning. And I'm wondering if any uh, general lessons 
um, applicable in classroom teaching as well as uh, remotely have been have been learned from uh, from this experience over the last 18 months. I've long been an advocate of the flipped classroom philosophy. I was very encouraged to see you mentioning it in this report and it appears in your next steps. I think that has a has a, a relevance beyond just uh, uh, digital work. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts of uh, um, how we might get data to promote effective learning and teaching um, based on, on the experience of the last 18 months. And if I may, my second question concerns something that is a national issue and a particular Angus issue, and that is the attainment gap. And I'm wondering if you have any early thoughts on what the impact of this remote learning may have been on, on the Angus uh, um, attainment gap experience. Thanks, uh, Mr. Summers. Uh, happy to take the question and I'll, I'll both questions and I'll start question two and I think Kelly will probably want to come in uh, on question two as well. As you were form formulating your question there, uh, Mr. Summers, that my, my mind immediately before you mentioned it went to flip learning and that was an important part of uh, the, the remote learning offer uh, of children engaging in the learning and the reading and the clips and the resources beforehand to come to the, the learning at the ready. And I think that's what been one of the biggest um, uh, shifts, if you like, uh, in, uh, in, in terms of pedagogy and how schools are approaching that. We've had pilot work going on in, in many schools, but probably as a more universal offer, breaking high school through the Google Classroom. I've been, uh, I've been trialing that and, and working with that for a number of years uh, and, and report successes through that uh, as well. And a, and a number of schools are doing it that way. Um, also, in, in terms of how we're doing feedback uh, and, and how feedback can be supported in learning through a, a remote learning platform, and that formed what well, well, a part of our in service training for staff in, in February, uh, just how we effectively do mm. that uh, and uh, and give children meaningful next steps in their learning and support that, but put that both support and challenge in there. So that would be the two biggies for me, uh, Mr. Summers, in, in, in terms of that. Um, but there are there are small bits around uh, how learning styles uh, and how some children have engaged better using. Uh, digital platforms, particularly some children with particular needs, than they, than they might have done in a more traditional classroom setting. So there the, there have been real opportunities all around. I think the biggest challenge around that is uh, is capturing that, embracing it, and making and mainstreaming it. Yeah. Uh, and, and not just making it something that happened uh, in a period of unprecedented circumstances. It really needs, and that'll be the job of our, our school leaders. And certainly a focus of our central teams to just saying how do we truly embed that and make it i hate the phrase the new normal but <laughs> the new normal in terms of the attainment gap we have seen a slight drop uh, in primary one and four um in, t in terms of the bge um uh, in terms of particularly uh, in literacy um we're, we're beginning to try to understand that uh, our schools have a common um, school improvement aid stretch in this year, which is to get 100% of learners back to the, the progress <laughs> trajectory progress they were on previously. And their school improvement plans, which are extremely high quality uh, in terms of the, and, and ambition and realistic, are targeting the, the, these specific interventions this year, really using a wide range of data to understand their context and really target that resource and target intervention to make sure that all our children are making the, pro the expected progress uh, prior to uh, the, the attainment lockdown. Kelly, I don't know if you want to come in and say anything else on that. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jim, and thank for, thanks for your question, Eric. It's very important to keep a focus on this. Um, so members will be aware that our results data was published earlier this week, so our children got the results, and, and you'll remember that we don't actually report to committee on attainment until the insight update. So generally March or April the following year, because we like to um, concentrate on our school leavers. We recognise that the senior phase is a three year deal 
and not everybody's going to do the same in fourth year or the same in fifth year and the same in sixth year. And actually on page 85 of the papers today, there is some data about our school leavers in SIMD quintile one. And so we generally speak about decile, so that would be decile one and two. So the children living in our most deprived areas. And you'll see for Angus that the data shows that at both five awards at level five and at level six, um, we have seen an increase, which is great. Um, it's sustaining that increase that's really important. <coughs> there are other tables in the data in the, the T plan report that look at average tariff points, and I'll be quite honest, and I am less concerned with those tables. Tariff points are given for, um, so in, as an example, a national five, you will gain a certain number of tariff points for a a C, 10 more tariff points for a B and 10 more tariff points again for an A. I am concerned about those tariff points because the quality of the pass is very important. But what I'm not concerned about are trying to um, gain loads of tariff points so that schools look good in a league table. What we are really concerned about, and I guess and I say this over and over again, is designing the correct learning pathway for each of our young people. So rather than just look at attainment in terms of tariff points or indeed attainment in terms of the percentage of young people achieving five at five, we need to look at it holistically. So including post positive destinations and then sustained destination information. And I think Jim alluded to um, our Angus education plan. Last year, we focused on literacy through reading because we recognised that when the children came back after the first lockdown, that that was an area of need. Our um, evaluation of the standards and qualities reports that have been submitted by our head teachers at the end of term show that this continues to be a need and we are allocating COVID funding to dedicated support around that area for the next school year. But we're also introducing a priority through numeracy because our head teachers have identified numeracy. And you'll see again from the T plan that numeracy was a priority for one of the groups in the T plan, but that's not to be taken forward this year. So we're taking that forward ourselves. So I guess um, in response to Mr. Summer's question, we are seeing small gains, but it's the sustaining of these gains that's important and keeping our eye on the fact that what we really want to do is close the poverty related attainment gap whilst also, and this is the really difficult part, increasing attainment for everybody. <laughs> and I think it's that bit that we have to keep our eye on. You'll have heard me spoken in this forum before about really building a robust 2 to 18 monitoring and tracking tool. That doesn't exist in Scotland the way that we want it to exist. And it's that holistic picture because not all of our children even enter <laughs> our early years provision at the same start point. So it's looking at the value added year on year and the interventions that are required to help all of our young people. Um, and the way that we put it in Angus is it's not about achieving your potential. I'd like to remind you it's about achieving more than anybody ever thought was possible for you. Because <laughs> who are we to decide what your potential is? Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Is, is that answer your quick, uh, quick questions there, Mr. Summers? Absolutely. Convenient. Thanks to Jim okay, and thank you. for these very full um, answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, that's the last of the questions. We now move on to the comment uh, part. We have Councillor McMillan Douglas, followed by Councillor Proctor. Uh, Councillor McMillan Douglas. Convenient. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to congratulate everybody in the education system in uh, Angus, but particularly um, Kelly and her team uh, for the progress made on uh, digital and remote learning. It's been tremendous. Of course, we know this has been happening around the world. And in fact, my daughter for many years now has run a remote tutoring service to all sorts of countries in the world, including, as it happens, Russia. Um, <laughs> But it is very, very good to know that we've taken, actually turned a desperate situation over the last 18 months, almost to our advantage in progressing the use of technology uh, in the way we have. Uh, so thank you all very much for that. I did want to come back to a point that was raised by a number of people, I think, um, 
uh, Councillor Proctor certainly was one of them, I think Councillor Speed was another, which was the provision of digital equipment. Um, we know the Scottish Government made a promise about this and it's referred to in the paper, but this digital equipment, this additional digital equipment has not yet arrived. It's one thing to make a promise, that's politicians find that easy, um, it's quite another to actually deliver. And so uh, I very much hope that either the money for this digital equipment uh, or the equipment itself will arrive so that uh, the opportunities of this type of learning really will be available uh, to every child. Thank you, convener. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Proctor. Thank you, convener. In fact, if I had a box clever, uh, one of my comments could have been a quiz. Can I? Um, linked in with what Mr. Summers uh, was alluding to. And some of the other um, things I'm involved in, um, we've actually embraced the technology uh, and we have spoken and communi communicated with people around the world. Uh, I have been in the past involved in uh, giving talks and lectures in, in schools in Angus and throughout Scotland, actually, on, on military history. And it strikes me that this um you know you know the, the technology that we're talking about not only um is going to be benefit the people who may be uh, at home but i think it actually would benefit the classroom and instead of people uh having to drive to webster's or for for academy or wherever you could probably set up a zoom link <coughs> with a class uh and and you know it, it, it would be beneficial uh, to both the, the, the pupils, uh, the teachers, um, and, in, and indeed the presenters. So that's something I think um, we really should embrace and we should enlarge upon. And I think that's kind of been alluded to earlier on. And my last point is, I think the report's great. And I do think on page 29, um, or the, with, with the feedback, the comments on the feedback from parents and carers and pupils, I think that's that's a good summary. It's very, it looks to be very honest, uh, and certainly something that we should be, you know, using as a coat hook and 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 hang our hat on for the future. So once again, well done, all concerned. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Proctor. Now we come to Councillor Bray's, followed by Councillor Whiteside. Councillor Bray. Thanks, convener. Um, I'll keep my comment brief, but uh, it's, it's a subject that I, I feel very strongly about. Poor digital connectivity can be life chance limiting for our young people. And there have been precious few silver linings to this COVID pandemic, but let's hope that renewed vigour in tackling connectivity poverty is one. So thanks. OK, thank I agree with you, Councillor Brace. Councillor Whiteside? Thanks. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, out of necessity, all of our young people have had to spend an awful lot more time online than they previously did when they were at school full time. And I just think it's possibly um, the, a good moment to reaffirm this committee's um, commitment to the Think Before Your Type campaign and to, to reaffirm our intolerance of bullying, especially online bullying, well, bullying of any type, actually. Um, but I think it's appropriate for us to do that at this point. Thanks. OK, thank you. Now, that is all the comments. Nobody else want to make a comment? No? OK, thank you, colleagues. A lot of interesting questions and uh, points raised there. Um, the, co the committee is now asked to agree the recommendations as per sections 1, 1, 1, 2 and 1, 3. Do we agree report 23821? Okay. Great. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Right, we now move to, we want to put Mark down. Agenda item number six, this is report 23921. And this is the funding early learning uh, framework cost review. And I believe that uh, Sarah Morgan, service leader, is going to introduce this report. Sarah? Thank you, Councillor Sturrock. 
Members of the committee are aware that 2020-21 was a very unique and challenging year in education and in early learning and childcare. When not in lockdown, the provision of ELC was undertaken within very controlled environments and with significant additional pressure on providers, including enhanced cleaning requirements and the need to separate children into a number of groups with no mixing. For many of our partner providers, this brought significant additional costs which Angus Council has been able to reimburse using remaining early years expansion funding. As the new ELC year begins, and to provide an updated current context for the report, as we know, Scotland has moved beyond level zero and into a period of reduced restrictions, one of which is the removal of the need for separation of children into controlled groups, with the only restriction for additional years, sorry, with only restriction to group size being the registration capacity. This should now remove the need for additional early, early year staff to be employed by our partners, significantly reducing the financial support they may need in 2021-22. However, the need for enhanced cleaning is still very much present in ELC and the care inspectors <coughs> have clarified their expectation that this practice should continue for the foreseeable future. Partners will therefore need some measure of additional funding for cleaning consumables and PPE, and the larger providers may need to employ additional cleaners for some time to come. Our contracted partners currently provide one third of all funded ELC in Angus, and this report seeks to protect those providers by securing the ongoing financial support they will need to be able to continue to safely educate and care for our youngest learners. Myself and Jamie Aitchison will be happy to answer any questions you might have on this report. Okay, thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, first question we had is from Councillor Bell. On you go, Councillor Bell. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah, and, and thanks to, to Jamie as well. I have a question on page 43 around the equality impact assessment um, when a negative impact is... Um, I, I understand we've been in extraordinary circumstances may be part of the reason but I would have hoped that if a negative impact is identified then a consultation would be good practice um, even if not statutory um, and I wondered if, if our default position uh, on this um, has maybe left a bit of a gap. I, I guess I'm coming from a place of not wanting to make assumptions about what those impacts might mean for a particular group. Um, so if you, if you can see under, you know, step eight, the section I'm referring to, um, was, you know, why was that decision made not to directly consult with pro female providers? Jamie, can I bring you in there? Yeah, thanks for raising that, Councillor Bell. Um, the, um, that negative impact was identified by our Equalities Advisor in, in um, conjunction with me. To be honest, because almost all of the early learning and childcare workforce is, is female, I've said 95% in the report, I think it's probably closer to 99% or more. Um, to undertake a consultation with that specific group would be to undertake a consultation with the entire early years workforce and with all of our contracted partners. So in that sense, it the reason for doing that was negated, if that makes sense, because the, the the specific protected characteristic is pretty much the entire workforce. So because the purpose of the report is to essentially request more money to, to provide to the entirety of our, our contracted partner framework, the consultation wasn't felt to be necessary. OK, could I come back on that? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, I think. I think if I had been in that cohort, I would have probably appreciated a communication even around we recognise this is an issue for almost everyone, you know, and we're, we're looking at it. However, if anyone has any specific concerns, please let us know. And, and we're actually going above and beyond, I think. Um, I, I don't have articles, but I, I certainly guess I would have felt the benefit of that if I um, and I would really like I know we do a huge amount of work engaging with our stakeholders I just think that would have been really the cherry on the icing on the cake for them um, and wondered if that could be considered for future situations that uh, that's all thank you very much Jamie appreciate that okay Sorry, thank you just... uh, that's all the questions is there any comment 
no comments coming forth. So uh, report 23921, do the committee agree? The recommendations is highlighted in 1-1 and 1-2 of this report. Agreed. 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 Right, thank you colleagues. Right, we now move to item agenda number seven. This is the Tayside Plan for Children, Young People and Families, the Annual Report 2021 and the Revised Plan for 21-23. Now, I understand that Mark Armstrong will introduce the report, but given the wide ranging nature of the content, uh, several officers might have to be called upon if, for any questions that may come forward. Uh, Mark? Thank you very much, convener, and good afternoon, committee members. So I'm extremely pleased to bring both the annual report on the current Tayside Plan for Children, Young People and Families that covers the period 2020 to 21, <coughs> and to bring that together with the refreshed Tayside Plan, which sets out our collaborative work with Dundee, Perth and Kinross, NHS Tayside and other partners that sees us through to 2023. As the committee will be well aware, the Tayside Collaborative has been in existence since 2017 and has been the subject of previous reports brought before this committee. And from this latest report, you will see that there's been a great effort to continue our partnership across Tayside with lots of work taking place on support to parents, continued support in relation to children's emotional and mental health and their learning and attainment. Some work has clearly been hampered by the pandemic as services and local areas have had to focus on responding to local need and recovery. Between January and March this year, each of the community planning partnerships across Tayside agreed to take stock on the future of our collaborative work. But I'm pleased to say that the conclusion of that consideration was that there continues to be significant benefit from us working together across not just our, our local partnership, but across the Tayside area. However, through that work, we, we have recognised that we need to focus in on a smaller number of more manageable and shared priorities and actions. And therefore, the plan you have before you today that will take us through the next two years clearly states that we won't work on everything together, but we will focus on those actions where we have, can have the most impact and make the most difference to children and their families. So I'm very pleased to present these reports in front of you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, any questions? I see that Councillor Laurie and Councillor Speed are the first two up. Councillor Laurie, on you go. Thank you, Convener. This was a really interesting report and I just had a question around the consultation that took place. I believe that decisions shouldn't be made about us without us. And with that in mind, I would expect any plan for children, young people and families to consult with a wide and diverse range of children, young people and families. Uh, however, looking at the consultation section on page 47, it does seem that the bulk of the consultation took place with uh, council officers and NHS Tayside. And I'm not seeing much about consultation with service users or young people and families, with the exception of some care experienced young people. Um, so could I maybe just get um, a bit more information and um, background on the consultations that took place? Yeah, certainly. Thank you very much, Councillor Laurie, and I'll, I'll bring in some of my colleagues uh, in a second. Um, I think as, as the report highlights, and that kind of really reflects on maybe the, the kind of formal aspect of consultation that took place across the uh, the collaborative system, but uh, underneath that and in relation to various strands of, of work, there were key areas of um, consultation engagement and engagement, particularly with uh, service users or families, you know, so whether that was to do with um, access to maternity services or, as you say, the work that we've, very um, effective work we've done with our care experienced young people or other young people that are, are kind of accessing services. And um, if that's useful at this stage, um, Chair. Um, so 
Um, Councillor Laurie, you, you're quite right. The, the cover report certainly does um, indicate, you know, set set to pieces. These are people who were um, consulted specifically about um, the, the committee report itself and who were engaged with the integrated children's services specific discussion. However, um, what what is also um, detailed in, 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 in part, at least um, in, in other parts of the, the report that's in the appendix, is around the, the parts of consultation and feedback that was drawn on um, to inform the content of the plan um, and the report. So, for example, in relation to the Tayside strategy for parents, which is one aspect of what this plan is hoping to um, encompass, um, there was quite a significant involvement with a range of children, young people and families across the whole of Tayside. Some of that was done by digital means, some of it was done in specific areas or through specific services. So all of the feedback that our colleagues in um, education and lifelong learning, for example, all the questionnaires and feedback from young people, um, the, the feedback that we have through complaints and kind of other processes as a local authority, and, and the intelligence that's gathered throughout the wider community of those who are working with children and families as well have all kind of fed into to this document. So whilst we've not had a, a specific session that was open to members of the public to drop into to discuss this particular report and this particular action plan, um, their views have absolutely been um, key to developing what is here. So I hope that gives a bit of a sense of how we got to where we've got to. OK, is that you satisfied, Councillor Laurie? Yeah, no, thank you for expanding on that. OK, thank you. Now we've moved to Councillor Speed. Yep, thanks, convener. Um, yeah, my first question was going to be just the same as what Councillor Laurie had raised. I was looking for a bit more information with regards to consultation. Um, it would have been nice to see a bit more detail on that. Um, but my second question is something that I raised in our integration joint board um, when I'd caught earlier sight of these plans. And it was around the the marked difference um, of primary school children who have an additional support need, and then the 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 quite marked increase by the time they reach secondary school. Um, I don't think at the time when the question was asked in the board meeting that that anyone could give a reason as to why there's such a a difference. Um, I think it's almost double in terms of the percentages, um, and I'm just concerned it's due to perhaps not identifying early enough the additional support need and that there hasn't been early enough intervention and support to reach diagnosis. Thank you very much, Councillor Speed. Could I ask Kelly McIntosh to respond to that? Uh, yeah, I think Audrey Osborne is on the call now and has uh, responded already versus email, but is very happy to answer the question. Thanks, Kelly. Um, apologies, Councillor Speed. I did get back to Councillor Devine um, following Integrated Children's Service Group, so I was remiss in not copying you into that. I'll certainly forward um, my email, which had full details in that. Um, I think you're absolutely right. There's, there is a discrepancy between the recorded figures. Um, there's always been an issue nationally in terms of the recording of additional support needs since the inception of the ASL Act. Um, and the definition is so broad. And there are so many categories um, within CMIS for recording. CMIS is the educational tool, obviously, for recording um, around children's needs um, as, as well as many other um, forms of data. Um, so I think... I'm confident that this is a recording issue and not one of not identifying additional support needs. Um, certainly know that from the support that we provide to our primary schools um, and in terms of you know, the, the feedback that we get from schools and, and how they're meeting needs through child's planning meetings. However, I, I noticed too that there, you can't compare between authorities because it's so subjective in terms of how we go about the recording. And that's why there's always a, a cautionary note with any national figures. However, we are looking at that more closely. And I think there needs to be maybe more consistency in the recording of additional support needs. We have guidance around recording on CMIS and addition, uh, recording of additional support needs specifically. Um, so we will look at that again. And we're, I've been in contact with colleagues in Dundee who've done a bit of work on this last year because they were experiencing similar issues. And I think if you look at the figures, 
um, the discrepancy between primary and secondary in Dundee is just as marked as it is um, for, for Angus, so it's not an Angus-specific issue. Um, however, we will work with colleagues in Dundee and also colleagues in, in, from Insight to see is there a better way of doing that um, to make sure that we are recording accurately. Um, but anecdotally, in our feedback from, you know, on the ground, so to speak, I don't think it's a, an issue of not identifying the needs through our continuum of need or indeed meeting those. I think it's one of consistency in recording. But I will forward the email that I sent to Councillor Devine. OK, thank you. I guess I was just going to, is it okay to come back, convener? Yes, on you go. Yeah, I was just going to say, in some ways, I, I didn't feel too surprised. It was perhaps more of an increase than I would have expected or hoped. But I do know that families often struggle uh, to, to get a diagnosis or, you know, their, their pathway to, to get that diagnosis can often be quite lengthy, often, you know, um, they perhaps get turned away at the first, you know, other professionals around the child don't recognise it or, um, like I say, wait times can be lengthy. So I wondered if that that perhaps had an impact. Can I respond? Yes, on you go. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Of course, every child with an additional support need doesn't necessarily have a diagnosis um, and our continuum of need is not based on that. However, for some of the neurodevelopmental issues that will require clinical diagnosis, that can absolutely be the case. And certainly through our um, Connected Tayside, our emotional health and wellbeing strategy, that's something that we've tried to address. And through the mental health funds that are available and um, working on a Tayside basis, along with our colleagues in CAMS to look at what supports and um, you know, earlier intervention can we provide to parents who are on that neurodevelopmental waiting list so that we can, can give them strategies and have that identification rather than waiting for 18 months and then getting a diagnosis or not um, or any follow-up um, follow support. So, yes, I think that's part of the picture and we're trying to address that um, on a Tayside-wide basis. OK, thanks, Ms. Osborne. OK, thank you. Thank uh, you. That's all the questions now. I'll open the floor to comments. Any comment? Uh, no comments coming. I, I, I have a comment. I have a comment. Uh, I am pleased to receive both of these reports today and see the breadth of the opportunities for children and families. It is certainly helpful to receive a more focused plan with specific actions within. I understand the intention of the Tayside plan is to link in with other Angus specific plans such as those of the Local Corporate Parenting Board, Child Protection and Alcohol and Drug Partnerships. It remains the case that there are many children and families who need additional help and support for many reasons, and providing the right help at the right time is our priority aim. Where we can work together with other, other areas, then we should, and I fully support our continued work as a key partner of the Tayside Collaborative for Children, Young People and Families. Thank you. So now we come to uh, the end of the report 241. And uh, do we agree the recommendations as per 11, 12, 13 and 14? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, Agreed. thank you, colleagues. Report 2421, 2021 is approved. Um, right now we come to agenda item number eight. This is the report on the Angus Adoption Agency and Fostering Panel Annual Report for 2020-21. I believe Catherine and Lindsay, you're going to introduce this. Thank you, convener. I'm I'm delighted um, to have Eunice McLennan on the call um, this afternoon, and, and Eunice was the author of this particular report. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just um, say this is the annual report. You will have seen um, previous iterations of of this report before, and I'm going to hand yeah. over to Eunice to take you through some of the key points. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. As Catherine said, I'm delighted to be sharing this report with you also. Um, this report is produced every year and it highlights Angus Council's ability to provide an effective service for children, foster carers, kinship carers and adoptive parents. It also highlights some of the challenges that we, that we face through this work and also some of the development work that we are doing. 
this year, like we've already mentioned, um, the course of the afternoon has been challenging for foster carers and children, um, as you would expect. And our foster carers have done a wonderful job during COVID, uh, the pandemic, to try and maintain placements, look after children, support children with their education demands, um, ensure children have contact with their families, um, connect brothers and sisters, and ensure that we have stability in our placements. And we have been successful in our work uh, this year in all these issues. You'll see in the report that it highlights the number of foster carers that we've approved, kinship carers, adoptive parents. There are challenges within the recruitment of foster carers, as we've highlighted, and I'm delighted to know, and the link is in the report, um, to advise that we have now got our own um, fostering adoption angus.gov website, which we have been working on for a wee while, and it's in order to try and give people a direct platform in to find out more about adoption and fostering. And the link is there if you'd like to, to look at that further. Um, we're always trying to recruit carers, and that is one of our, our big challenges. And we are being as creative as we can in order to do that. And you'll see um, probably things in Radio T uh, coming up in the next few while uh, as we're trying to continue to promote interest in fostering and adoption. Um, the report also talks about uh, some of the work we've done to try and improve services. So for every carer who, who finishes their time fostering, we do exit interviews. And in that, we look at the strengths and the areas for further development. Um, we have a permanence forum, which we try and drill down on the children who we think may need a uh, permanence planning and support the work that is undertaken there. Despite the challenges this last year, you will note that we've actually imp uh, increased the number of children uh, that we've approved for permanence, which is really positive um, given all the demands and restrictions that have been in place. And despite this, we've also been able to progress children into adoptive and permanent placements, which is very encouraging for them. Uh, we are doing some development work around our skills level scheme. We have ongoing training for carers and you'll remember that in a previous committee back in February, uh, we shared information about the secure based model that we are implementing across the service in order to try and support carers and how they look after our children and help to repair some of the trauma and neglect that they've experienced. We continue to develop our adoption support work um, and this year we're focusing very much on the promise and looking at how we implement that within carer support and ensure that we are giving children the best outcomes that we can. We're also doing work on brothers and sisters and the agenda around siblings um, mm -hmm. and ensuring that carers um, are supported in order to help brothers and sisters maintain contact, be placed together where possible and have opportunities to spend quality time together. So that's just some of the highlights from the report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. OK, thank you, Eunice. Um, we have uh, questions uh, forthcoming for you. We have Councillor Bell, followed by Councillor Speed, followed by Councillor Devine. Uh, Councillor Bell? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Eunice. Uh, I mean, this is such an important area of work, um, and I, obviously coming from a place of very being very mindful around our role as corporate parents and the promise. Um, quite concerned about, uh, I mean, notwithstanding we've come through an incredible period um, that no one expected, but the, the numbers of new families being approved to the process and, and uh, the report doesn't say how many people had applied, but I'm, I wondered if you could tell me a bit more about the attrition rate um, people who kind of drop out or aren't approved through the the process, because going by the the numbers in the report, we're we're kind of sitting at a bit of a deficit. Um, if fourteen um, carers have left and another eight are waiting uh, for deregistration, that does concern me. And also um, the impact of court closures during COVID uh, and. If, if you can quantify how that has impacted on um, children and, and young people awaiting placement, um, that's a concern. Um, and also, if I, I know we have a, a bit of a problem around legal support internally, um, is there a timeline on how, the, how and when that's going to be addressed to, to help the, the process as well? I was also, I mean, really pleased about the sibling to get siblings together uh, work. I think that's so important and I'm sure it'll 
help a lot of families. Um, I was also concerned around the birth parent support that wasn't possible to progress during COVID, but other groups were. Um, and, and I think families got a lot out of that. Um, I, I feel that's a worrying omission um, and wondered how soon that can be picked up um, because I think it's an important part of, of what we do in a very holistic way. I did have lots of other questions, but I'll leave them for another day. But I'm, I'm just trying to, to look at sort of bigger picture stuff, Eunice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. I'm more than happy to have it in the individual discussions if you want to go into things in further detail, but I will, I will cover the, the, the points that I've taken, the main issues you've said. So in terms of approvals, I, I don't actually have the exact detail of the number of um, people that come forward and then drop out. What I would say is that we have a number of inquiries. Um, um, overall, the inquiries have reduced and we've done a lot of work on looking at our inquiries to make sure that when somebody inquires, we follow through in a timely manner within 24 hours. We send them an information pack, pack we track whether we hear from them, we then contact them again, we give them a couple of weeks and then we contact them again. We don't, we don't um, be overzealous in that approach, but we just want to make sure that people have the information and that we're keen to follow things up with people. Um, we have a number of people that do that and then don't take things forward. But as I say, I don't have exact numbers, but I can certainly share that with you. Um, there, there's very few people that uh, progress with an application and then don't progress to a full assessment. Very few, but that's quite un unusual if that was ever to happen because we're really clear as part of the pre-assessment training, you know, what fostering involves or adoption, what we're looking for, what we can support you with, what are the issues and challenges with the children that we're looking to place. So it's a very thorough process. So by the time we come to an application process, we're, we're fairly confident that people want to progress. Now, sometimes assessments, you know, can, can be delayed or they can uh, be postponed for periods to do with per people's personal circumstances, things like that. But that's all just on an individual case by case basis. Um, I would say that, you know, the recruitment of carers is a challenge and that's why we are so proactive and it's um, something that's very much a, a huge focus for us within the service and we work with Angus Council's um, marketing team and we also have foster carers involved in our recruitment um, meetings that we have on a regular basis so we, ha we have a huge focus and it's something we work on. We accept that uh, foster carers you know, sometimes there is a, a lifetime you know in terms of how long people want to foster for and people's family circumstances change or they want to move on to other um, areas of, of work so we, we, we do see it we do see a turnover in carers and that's always been right we're not seeing the growth that we would like and it's something we are very very focused on so i hope that's sort of covered that area <laughs> uh, i think the next thing you'd asked about was the court closures um, and what i would say is we've been very fortunate in terms of being able to progress uh, permanent applications during uh, the pandemic and although courts have closed for a lot of areas of business they actually haven't closed for this area of business I, um, I'm not sure if there's been maybe slight delays but overall we have seen permanent order applications being approved we've seen matches and we've seen children adopted um, so we feel that that's not had a, a huge impact that it may have done with other parts of court business um, so we're, we're quite pleased about that in terms of legal support, we work very closely with our colleagues in legal and they are part of the process when we start to talk about permanence for children. So when we talk about the permanence forum, that's when we have the sort of first discussions with legal about the way forward. You're correct, there are pressures within that service and we're working very closely with them to try and address that, to prioritise what children we feel are needing the services um, immediately and what, what children through different circumstances we can we can. Um, look at other options for them in, in the short term. Um, so we, we are working closely to try and mitigate against uh, any pressures there. Uh, in terms of birth parent support, I think it was a birth parent group that we were looking to start up. And you know, it's obviously a very emotive and difficult issues for, for birth parents. So we have done individual contacts <coughs> with birth parents during this period. We've had one or two face-to-face -face contacts that I know of. I'm not sure the, the full detail, but we certainly have seen birth parents. Uh, I think it was about the opportunity 
opportunity of bringing people together. Some of our, we know from some of our contact with birth parents during coming to fostering adoption, of coming to adoption panels, permanence panels, they don't always like doing these things, um, you know, on a screen. So we have made arrangements, for example, for them to come into Angus House to have, have direct contact. But I think it was a trend of bringing a group of people together. It just wasn't seen to be the right thing to do during the pandemic. We have linked with people and we are still working with people. What we haven't done is bring a group together, but that is something very much on the agenda for moving forward. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you, Eunice. Uh, next thank we you. come to Okay, thank you, Councillor Bell. Uh, uh, next we come to Councillor Speed. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um yeah, I had similar uh, concerns and, and questions to Councillor Bell in terms of versus the, the difficulties in terms of foster care and, and recruitment. Um, however, uh, Mrs McClellan has answered that um, for me. My other uh, question was around um, the changes in legislation um, and the, 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 the duty to place uh, siblings together where appropriate, as well as uh, the rights of the child, which I fully support and welcome. Um, it's obviously crucial that we try and keep uh, you know, siblings together. Um, my thoughts and concern and a question is around what impact that may have on uh, foster carers' um, housing need and their, their ability to, to take in um, siblings together because of room space um, and what kind of uh, supports um, can be put in place to make that possible or, or what can be done to remove some of those barriers. Um, is there funding available in terms of being able to help with adaptation um, to, to create additional bedroom space. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my, my thoughts around that. And also as well, I guess, what impact it may have on um, individual children who are in placements and, and will that have a knock on effect on them? Thank, thank you, Councillor, Councillor Speed. Um, we, we've been very fortunate in Angus Council. We've always promoted uh, brothers and sisters staying together when when they can do. So that's been our practice for years. So in some ways, that nothing's really going to change in terms of that because we've all, we've always done that. We've always looked at that. We've always tried to facilitate that. Um, and we do have a number of brothers and sisters that are placed together. I think some of the challenges are that for some of the children we work with, there's a number of blended families, there's quite extended family networks, and there's you know multiple um, half siblings, etc. For some of the children that we work with, so it's about trying to manage, you know, who. Who's, who's got the most key relationships, the dynamics between the children. We do assessments to make sure that when we, when we do place brothers and sisters together, that we've got the, the relevant supports in place. One of the real positives with the change in legislation is that we can increase the number of children that a foster carer looks after eh, to allow brothers and sisters to place, whereas before we were capped um, by the number of children in any placement. So that gives us a wee bit more flexibility, um, although we've always been able to try and, try and work around that um, in different ways when we, when we can. Um, we have done adaptions to people's houses before to, to accommodate children, not just brothers and sisters, but sometimes bringing a child back from a residential resource and we want them to have a family and, and we've been quite creative in the past. So that's something that we would look at if there was demand. Um, I think I've already ex 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 expressed the view that there's a demand for foster carers in general, but we are we are working closely with our carers and a number are very proactive in terms of taking brothers and sisters. And where that's not possible, because sometimes it's not in children's best interest to stay together, we do good assessments, so we're clear the reasons why children are not together. We support the children um, and help. I'm sorry, my dog's just started to bark. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, um, sorry, so um, so we've done work with that, but we also work with carers to allow them to have contact with um, carers, so they facilitate contact, they have brothers and sisters for tea, they'll take each other for respite, they'll, they'll do things like that in order to, to help uh, move matters forward. Um, at the moment we had a, a meeting with our carers last week and we're looking at a charter, so we're really clear of what we're expecting to support brothers and sisters and we can share that in due course once we've got that drafted up. But I would say within the fostering community there's a real commitment to having brothers and sisters being together and having relationships um, and we're just going to build on that because that, that's not necessarily something new. Um, so I hope I hope that's uh, answered that question. Sorry, I've just been a bit distracted with my dog there. Yeah, 
Thanks, Mr. McClellan. And um, yeah, I'm just to, pleased to hear as well about the Charter and look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Eunice. Now we've got... Um, oh, I, I saw your, your hand going up and down yeah. there, Lois. Um, we've now got Councillor Proctor followed by Councillor Brace. Councillor Proctor. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, Eunice, um, thank you for that very, very uh, full uh, briefing you gave um, both Councillor Bell and Councillor Speed, because some of the stuff I was going to ask was they'd already asked. But um, as you quite rightly pointed out, as you quite rightly pointed out, the um, you know the, the the recruitment of carers is really paramount, and um, you, you, you know having a the correct uh, family there to look after um, the children um, is really really important because a stable and loving uh, family home produces good citizens in the future. So how long roughly does it take from sort of flash the bang from when you, when somebody puts in an application? Um, they've gone through all the procedures uh, and until they're sort of, you know, they've ticked all the boxes and 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 they're ready to uh, accept children. What, what's a sort of time frame? Because there's obviously a great problem here, as you've alluded and, and others have said, um, you know, about getting the right folk for that job. Thank you, Councillor Proctor. Uh, what we do is, so when somebody inquires, uh, we go out and we give them the information, as I've said, we then do a home visit. And then the next stage is we invite them to our uh, pre-assessment training. Now, to make that work, we need to have a number of carers um, to be part of that process. We've tried to do it individually, we've tried to do it in small groups, but it's not as effective as it is if we can get a number of people. So sometimes there can be a wee bit of a delay at that point, but we are really cre creative. So we do things like we start the assessment process while we're waiting for the training to happen and we try we try to really reduce the delays. Realistically, it takes about six to nine months um, to, you know, from inquiry to approval. Um, if all if all's going well, it's something that we can't rush. We need to do it thoroughly. We need to be really clear that carers have a good understanding of what the needs um, of the children are, but also what we expect of you as a foster carer. So it does take time. We have to take up references. We have to do various checks. We have to uh, meet with the children of the carers, for example, that are coming forward. So there's quite a lot of work involved in doing an assessment. Um, so roughly between six and nine months, if, if things are fairly um, straightforward. Thank you. And I presume that's similar to adoption as well. Yes, it's a, it's more or less the same process. They they go through a different sort of form of a pre-approval training, and then they do their assessment period, um, and then um, we get them approved and take things forward thereafter. Thank you very much, Eunice. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eunice. Now we come to Councillor Braze. Yes, thanks, convener. Um, is a uh, Angus markedly different to other local authorities with a similar demographic when it comes to our success in recruiting uh, carers? To, thank you, Councillor Brace. To be honest, it's a national issue. So it's a significant issue across Scotland about the lack of fostering resources and the, the lack of foster carers. Um, so recently, for example, uh, through Social Work Scotland, there was discussions about should we do a national campaign uh, using sort of television adverts, etc., to try and recruit because it's it's a massive issue. Um, I think what, what we're successful with in, in Angus is that despite the fact that we do see carers move on, that we do maintain placements for children and we do support a lot of children to live locally, and we're, we've got better outcomes than some of our neighbouring authorities who actually can you know have that level of children remaining in their community within our own resources. Um, so. Um, I think overall um, we, we do pretty well with that, but, but it is a national pressure. Um, and I think overall we're keen to see if there will be some sort of national um, sort of promoting of the challenges around getting uh, children into foster care. Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, so it, it seems that it is a widespread uh, national problem and it's reassuring to know that we, we sort of aren't slipping behind uh, similar local authorities. So thank you. Thank you. Chair, if it's at all possible for me just to add to um, Eunice's points, then Councillor Braze, that might okay. be um, of, of interest, is that the Angus does have a disproportionate um, number of external fostering agencies who recruit actively in this area. Um, we have um, a lot of competition 
um, from other parts of the marketplace, if you like, um, for the recruitment of foster carers. And that's one of the reasons why um, this committee has previously seen uh, multiple reports around our arrangements for the, the fostering um, allowances and fees, um, why we constantly review what it is that we offer and the support that we put in place, why we've invested in our own uh, website, etc. Because we are competing in a marketplace where foster carers are um, a very finite resource, a very precious resource. And um, if other agencies recruit Angus based um, potential foster carers or adoptive parents, um, then those are those are carers that, that are not uh, at our disposal for local Angus children necessarily. Um, now, it's not to say that we would never place children uh, with those agencies and, and they might happen to have a carer in our area, um, but that wouldn't be the default. Um, so it, I think it's quite helpful to just to express that this is not just a public sector marketplace and that adds some complexity uh, and that Angus is disproportionately impacted by that aspect. Yeah, and, and, and so would, would you say that the, the competition is, is uh, greater in Angus than it might be in other local authority areas then? Certainly our understanding of that, and it's all anecdotal, but our understanding of that is yes, that there are areas of Angus where that is certainly the case. Um, okay. and what, what you tend to find is areas where um, there's a, a greater um, proportion of, of affluent um, communities um, attract a greater number of foster carers. And there's lots of reasons why that might be the case. Um, perhaps more time um, uh, you know, to, to uh, commit to caring responsibilities out with your own family, perhaps bigger properties available, um, which means that people think that they have the capacity to, do, to offer that um, additional kind of support. Um, who knows? But there, there are definitely um, kind of areas of Angus where um, foster carers are actively sought by uh, other parties. Okay, that, that uh, certainly uh, helps my understanding of the situation. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Now, um, that's the question's over. Any comment? Uh, no comment? Well, thanks to Catherine and uh, Eunice. All I can say is uh, one of my aunts was a long-term foster carer. And, of course, you know, short-term, long-term. And it was one thing I always, they were always well looked after and they were you know, positive impact upon their lives. And and for me, I was also always getting new players for the five-a-side football team. So that was the, I can remember from these these happy days. So thank you, thank you. Um, colleagues, now we come to uh, report 24121. And do we agree the recommendations as in 1-1 one, one and 1-2? One, Great. Agreed. Okay, thank you, colleagues. That's uh, report 24121 agreed. Uh, that ends today's uh, meeting, and I'd like to thank everybody, uh, all attendees, for their excellent questions, comments, and the officers for, for their responses. So that's the meeting concluded. Thank you. Goodbye just now. <laughs>